So, Paulette, we got an email from a patron, patron Mahela, and she is writing about her feelings about her therapist. She thinks that there might be a sexual attraction. So I thought we would read the email and, and sort of provide some thoughts and advice. What do you say? Is this one of your patients? No, not one of, one of mine. It's a, I don't know where this person is. But anyway, what do you say? Let's do it. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I am chair of the Couple and Family Therapy Program at Antioch University, Seattle, and I'm also a psychotherapist. And I'm Paulette Perhatch. I'm a writer living in Seattle. The email starts by saying, I'm a four, I am 40 years old and I am from Europe. I am in psychotherapy since six months now due to a deep depression, being away from my family. I am a corporate working mom. And by the way, patron Mahela consented to using her name. So she's, she's working a lot and she's a corporate working mom. My therapist is exceptional, extremely professional, and I feel better after talking to him. I can tell I have a different view about myself. She goes on to say, my therapist is that person who listens, is interested in my problems. He is there for me. He understands me. He never judges me and he cares about me. He is crazy good looking as well. <laughs> Doesn't hurt. Is there anything more that I can ask from someone? So, you know, he's there for her, he's listens to her, and he's crazy good looking. Is there anything more I can ask for someone, she says. I like him a lot, but I am aware of the boundaries, and I am protecting myself from being emotionally hurt. Therefore, I see him as my therapist and a professional friend. I never flirt and never make moves on him, but I talk about my past sexual experiences in detail, and this is a part of our therapy. He seems particularly interested in that area. Would, why, who wouldn't be, generally speaking, she says. Any thoughts on this? Oh, God. Yeah, I mean, I think we've talked about before how when you see a therapist, it mimics a lot of what you want out of a relationship. You want someone who's not going to judge you, who listens to you. But also, it's like you say all those things. It's like if you're like, oh, I'm really attracted to this stripper I see all the time. She laughs at my jokes. She sits on my lap. So you're saying what us else? therapists were basically just strippers? Pretty much. You're emotional strippers. Yeah. Whereas a stripper gives you what you want sexually, a therapist often gives you what you want emotionally, which mm-hmm. is like connection and a listening ear. Yeah. And you have to pay for it. Yeah. But um, no, I'm just kidding. Um, you guys are obviously trained to help people, but that listening part and that caring part is hard to find. It's hard to talk to people in a way that is... So honest, you know, a lot of times like I'll go to therapy and I'll just like lay some stuff out, you know, and then I'll come home and my boyfriend will be like, how was it? I'll be like, fine. I'm just like, he's, he doesn't like this thing happened to me and I had this emotional experience. He's not a part of that at all. It was my therapist. And I've actually been thinking about this in a different kind of way of a relationship with my therapist. Like, I love her. She's so great. She's so nice. She's like an older mentor to me you know almost like you know I don't live close to any of my family I don't live close to my mom my grandma passed away last year you know so she's like like sometimes I'll want to be like if I I one of my big things right now is oh my god should I have kids or not I can't tell I don't know I'm 33 I have to decide freak out and I wanted to be like like oh did you have kids or like what do you you know like ask her about her life and I'm like oh this isn't like a normal relationship this is a very one-sided relationship like she's not my buddy She's not my mentor, really. Like, she is my therapist. It's a very specific situation, but yet we're all humans. So it's this kind of artificial setup, but a very real experience between two people. Yeah. Yeah, very well put. It's a very real experience between two human beings. Yeah. It's an intimate relationship. Sometimes one has a penis and the other has a vagina. And yet... That's where trouble starts. It's it can be very one direction in in some ways, and therapists are different. Some therapists, if you ask them, so how did you make? Do you have kids? How did you make that that choice? Many therapists would say, oh, this isn't about me. This is mm-hmm. about you. But other therapists will talk about that. Mm-hmm. Um, Self disclosure, as they say, is a powerful and empirically proven effective tool if used right in therapy. And so, but we have to be careful as therapists about how we do that. And that is, it's a tool for connection. I remember when I was a reporter and you're interviewing someone, one way to get someone to open up is 
to talk about your own similar experiences. Right. Exactly. It has that effect. It also has a mentoring effect, which, Mm -hmm. you know, it can be okay. It also has a normalization effect. You know, if your therapist said, well, when I was 33, I had the exact same thoughts as you did. And I I had no idea what to do. And I asked people and I, you know, really, and in the end I decided to do blank. And I, you know, I don't know if it's the right choice, but da, 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 da. Since you look up to her, you might say, oh, it's not just me. This is normal. It's okay. Now, I feel better already knowing that such a respectable person as her had the exact same feelings that I did. And she's telling me there is no answer, that there's no right or wrong answer to this, that I just have to live with the fact that there's no right answer to this. And so, and if she just said to you, you're normal, it's okay, it, that has a certain effect. But if she actually said, I know what this is like, and let me tell you, that has a bigger effect. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. But getting back to this email, she's saying, I never flirt and never make moves on him, but I talk about my past sexual experiences in detail, and this is a part of our therapy. He seems particularly interested in this area, and she says, who wouldn't be? What do you think about that? Yik- um, yeah, You have a yikes face. Yikes, for sure. I am the type of person who would just like go for it in some kind of way because because one time I remember in high school at graduation this guy was like well, that night we were all drinking and he's just like I always liked you but I never said anything and I was like what you know so you never know and so I often put the moves on a guy if so wait are you telling this person to make a moves on her therapist I don't know <laughs> <laughs> what maybe do you mean I like well, well are you saying like maybe they actually have a future romantically is that impossible he would never do i don't know the ethics on on your side that's interesting what country is this in maybe there's different ethics in different countries yeah i don't know that's a good question maybe you need a different kind of therapy are, if you know what i mean are you so it's interesting you know because you're outside the industry and obviously in a lot of tv shows and movies there's a lot of romantic action between therapist and client. Are you affected by that? Because in my industry, that is, it's, it's not only just something you're not supposed to do, but it's almost like an impossibility, although it does happen occasionally. I mean, that's the thing. It's like you think about with like college professors and students, totally frowned upon, but it happens. But, you know? and there, uh, there isn't an ethical board for professors usually you, you could get fired potentially if there's a policy what are the possible that? consequences if you're a therapist you would lose your license and you would never be able to practice again really yeah oh that, my god that surprises surprising. you yeah that really surprises me yeah no it if it was ever found out that you had sexual relations with a client you would never practice again see i hate rules like that <laughs> what if like you're what if someone is just kind of having a hard time let's say like you're like i moved to a new city i'm having a hard time I'm going to start seeing a therapist. You start seeing a therapist. This is your soulmate. The therapist realizes your soulmates. Mm-hmm. That has to ruin your career. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You essentially have to say, I guess I'm never going to be a therapist again. Oh my God. Yeah. I hate rules like that. Well, there are a lot of different things. I'm really, I'm really glad that we're talking about this because I imagine a lot of people are like you. Because you, especially because in movies and TV, a lot of therapists have sex with their clients. In the past, it used to be more along the lines of what you're saying. Until 20 or 30 years ago, it was like, well, it's frowned upon, but it wouldn't ruin your career. In fact, early on, men and women psychoanalysts in the, you know, Freud's students, Mm -hmm. including women, would have sex with their clients. They would fall in love with their clients. Mm -hmm. They weren't just having sex with all their clients, but there'd be one or two patients that they would fall in love with and even potentially marry. And that's the thing like that they'll say is as a joke in ethics courses, you'll hear, well, you won't hear it in courses, but ethics experts that I know will say things like, it's okay if you have sex with your client, just never piss them off. Because if they complain about you, your career is over. Because wow. the, that's the only thing is like, you can have sex with your clients, but if no one ever finds out, that's okay. Yeah. I mean, not okay, but your career is okay. But so the joke is, if you have sex with your client, make sure you marry them (laughs) because they won't want to ruin your career. It's really like I can see the other side where it's like, let's say someone else comes in. They're completely emotionally shattered, totally emotionally vulnerable. And some creepo 
unethical guy totally takes advantage of a codependent person, someone he knows is addicted to sex. You know, I mean, there's a lot of vulnerability there that I understand. I just think that's really harsh because you meet a lot of people meet their husbands and wives at work. Right. You know? <laughs> yeah. Having said that, I will say as a supervisor and as a therapist for 20 years, this rarely happens where a therapist will say or even think, oh, I'm in love with my client. In a real, mm -hmm. they might say, oh, I'm attracted to this person kind of, or, oh, if we met in different circumstances, I could see how blah, 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 blah. But it's a pretty rare thing, mostly because it's drilled into our heads that you just don't even go there. Yeah. And so it's, and it's never been a problem for me for whatever reason. I, I just, it's just never been a problem for me. But yeah, the other thing is, is that it's a different kind of relationship. So if you fall in love under those circumstances where it's a therapist and a client, what's the chance that your romantic relationship outside of the office will be functional? Because the therapist is in power yeah. and the client is not. And it's a similar thing when a professor and a student fall in love and get married. In fact, I've had clients along these lines. And that power dynamic will create problems for the rest of their relationship. Wow. Have you ever had a client tell you they're attracted to you? I have. And it isn't very frequent, but it happens. As you were saying, it's, a, it's an intimate experience. And particularly if you've literally never had anyone care for you mm. in, a, in a secure way, and then you have someone that meets with you every week and has tons of eye contact, yeah. and listens to every word you say, and never judges you, and is secure and there for you, and never abandons you. And when you are a jerk to me, I take it. I don't retaliate. <laughs> I'm nice back. Yeah. I'm, I'm, you can imagine how your heart would just pour out with attachment needs, including romantic needs. Mm -hmm. And it happens. And it's just a part of therapy. And what she goes, this uh, listener is, goes on to, or his patron actually goes on to describe some of that. But um, so that's just another thing to think about f as for therapists in particular is, okay, we're having this feeling but it's, it can't really be analogous to dating romance because this is a different circumstance. You know what I mean? Okay. So she goes on to say, now, my therapist seems... To, well, the other thing that, I, that I'm interested in terms of what she's saying is like she is thinking that her male therapist is particularly interested in her sexual stories. She's, she's talking about her sexual experiences in detail, and he seems particularly interested in this. What do you think about that? A lot of things could be going on here. Number one, they could be very related to her current situation. And relevant to therapy. Yeah, and relevant to therapy. Two, he could just be <laughs> interested in hearing stories about sex. Always funny slash interesting because they're about sex. Yeah. I don't know what the third, third one. Maybe he's attracted to her. Yeah, right. What yeah. if, okay, what if two people get together in America and then they like run off to Thailand? Could you practice in Thailand or is it like a global? <laughs> you really want therapists. I really want, I believe in like adult. Consent. Adult consent of just like, yeah. I mean, maybe there's some kind of review board. Maybe there's some kind of form you have to fill out as a patient. Nope. Just never. Never. I don't like rules. I don't like rules at all. I'm so that kind of person. I don't like rules either. I appreciate that, Paulette. But there are very few rules in therapy, which is I, which is, I like that. Mm -hmm. People, students are always asking me, you know, what's the rule? How do I, even in ethics. Mm -hmm. and, what I'll, and what I will sometimes say is there's no rules to therapy except don't have sex with your clients. Wow. <laughs> so, so there are very few rules except for this one rule. One rule. And it was not always the case. You know, back in the day, it, it was to some extent just frowned upon and it wouldn't ruin your career. Now wow. it, it'll ruin your career, yeah. And it makes a lot of sense for a number of reasons. What if you can't fight that feeling any longer? Then you fantasize with your other partner. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> or you role play with them or something. Please sit on the couch. I'm going to call you Karen, and you're going to tell me about your trichotillomania. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, and I've heard this before, and people, if you're, if you're a therapist, and essentially 
you're listen you're probing questions, so to speak, about sex because you are personally getting off on that. That is a, an abusive use of your power. That's it's creepy. It's, it's creepy. It's obviously not therapeutic. The client will probably pick up on that. As a therapist that is totally open to talking about sex with my clients, I can tell you that I know where that line is in my mind. And I am, am always at least somewhat aware of this issue that as I talk about sexual issues with clients, that I make, make sure that they never get the impression that I'm asking for my own benefit. What did that feel like? Right. It, there's a certain way that you can ask questions that are safe. You know, like it's, and sometimes I'll even say something like, well, we don't need to go into the details, but da 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 You know, I'll, I'll say something like, we don't need to go into the detail, like if I'm talking to a couple. Make sure you really paint the picture. Right. Yeah. R- tell me, do you have pictures? <laughs> um, so, I, you know, I Next say... Next time I think you should videotape yourself having sex yeah. and we'll review that footage here. In fact, this couch is probably big enough. <laughs> is, uh, I would say, you know, you don't... You, we don't have to go into details, but, but overall, was it satisfactory to both of you or something like that, you know, rather than like, at, rather than going into the specifics so that I can get at what I'm really therapeutically curious about is whether or not it's satisfactory for both people. My favorite was on Sex in the City where they go to a sex therapist and she encouraged them to have like a neutral word for their different genitalia. So it was like his penis was the sailboat and her hoo-ha was the dock or something. And he's just like, when my sailboat was coming into the dock. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> Man overboard. <laughs> All right. The patron goes on to say, now my therapist seems to be very happy to see me, eager to meet me. He likes talking to me all in a nice professional way. Maybe the same is true with all of his clients. But he told me that there is something about me that makes men go crazy. Oh my God. Okay, well, that sounds kind of bad. He told me that there's something about me that makes men go crazy. It sounds flirty. Maybe he wants to get flirty and dirty. Yeah. Maybe he wants to make a career change. So let's go on. I was shocked as I do, as I do not see myself as a flirter. I am married and I love my husband. Ew. I may find some men attractive, but that is all in my mind and I don't want to show it to anyone. So what is it about me that makes men go crazy? It sounds flirty. I mean, have you ever met like a person that seems to provoke a lot of romantic response? Yeah, like a sexy person. Yeah, I've met them. But they're sexy. <laughs> <laughs> they're sexy and then there's sort of animal magnetism. People who just ooze sex, yes. Or ooze, there's sex. So let me go on because I think she, it's not only sex per se that she... Anyway, he told me I have a kind of combination of sweet little girl with the adult woman's look and all together with the way I talk and what I say. He said that he, as, as a therapist, can understand where the, other, where the look comes from, from my rough childhood and corrupted relationship with my mother, but other men can easily fall for me. This is something that I've, that I've seen, actually, in, in some people, in that they have a certain way that they present themselves that just tends to produce a lot of romantic gestures from people. Hmm. And I've talked with people in this position where they're like, I don't understand it. Everywhere I go, I get in an Uber and the guy asks me out and he's like 30 years older than me. Mm-hmm. And I, I go to the store and someone comes up to me and says that they never do this and they want to ask for my phone number. And, and so, you know, because if you're, if you're very good looking, like a, in the model direction, it's not just that, you know? And because I feel like if you're, sort of in the model direction, you won't actually get a lot of people approaching you. But there's some kind of look or presentation that seems to provoke a lot of responses from mm. people. And I've met a few people. Actually, Lita, your predecessor, Paulette, yeah. on the podcast, she's kind of like that. She, she gets a lot of people that approach her, even though she would never say that she's like in the model direction. You know, she's good looking, but she's not... She's not like a model. Exceptionally good looking. Yeah. And, and she doesn't dress particularly sexy. There's just mm. something about her energy or something. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm. Seems like you don't know what I'm saying. Not really. I mean, I know people who are, I would think like physically attractive. Yeah. I mean, there are some people who do have that energy, but I'm thinking more of like a provocative, flirty energy. I don't know. Yeah. And w- the way I interpret this 
this patron's email is that the, and it's hard to know because I'm not there and I'm not talking to the therapist, but I'm guessing that the client here is saying to the therapist, look, I seem to be provoking this a lot of response in other people. I'm wondering why that is. And over time, the therapist is just being honest and saying, well, actually, I think there's something about just kind of your vibe that tends to produce this. I, I don't think that you're like every other woman. I think there is something about you. And again, as he was pointing out, it has to do with your childhood and this sort of thing. It, you might have a reason to look to please other people in this way to get that kind of attention. I don't know if that's what he's saying, but essentially it sounds like that's what he's saying. It sounds weird they're talking so much about sex because she's like, I'm having a hard time and missing my family and that's why she's in therapy. I'm having what? Like she's, I think she said she's having, she's in therapy because she's missing her family and having a hard time. At work and stuff. At work. So it's just interesting that so much sex is coming into it. It sounds like he's kind of flirting with her. Yeah. All right. From her perspective, right? But we have to take into account, this is from her perspective. If we talk to him, he'd be like, oh my God, are you kidding me? No. He could be like, I'm gay. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like we don't know yeah. what, what's going on in his mind. So then she goes on, he asked to talk with me about transference. I can't say I have deep feelings for him and not because I can't, but because I don't want to. I would feel extremely ashamed to talk with him about my feelings for him. So she sounds like she has like some ambivalence there. She sounds like if she went in a direction, she would have deep feelings for him, romantic, mm -hmm. dependent feelings. But she's sort of not doing that because she wants to keep it professional. And then he's wanting to talk about transference. This is a thing that psychodynamic therapists like myself tend to want to think about, tend to want to talk about with their clients. You want to talk about the client's feelings towards the therapist as a way of understanding the inner workings of a client mm -hmm. and understanding their tendencies and their relationship uh, issues and their relationship patterns. You utilize the relationship between client and therapist as a way of understanding in general what relationships are like for them. And you use that relationship to affect change for corrective experiences. So for instance, this therapist might be thinking, and I don't know, because I have no way of knowing, of course, but therapist could be thinking, okay, I think my client is having some dependency issues, some attraction issues, some boundary problems. And if we talk about those, I can provide a corrective experience by not exploiting her, by listening to her, by allowing her to talk about what she wants to, by being close and being warm with her, but again, not exploiting her and not making it about me. And that can be a corrective experience for the client. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So maybe that's what he's thinking. I don't know. And I think also she could limit how much she talks about sex in therapy or find that boundary where it feels like a little too sexual. Right. It sounds to me like she might be a little creeped out by it. And so, but having said that, she, in terms of transference, in terms of talking about the relationship, that is a perfect thing to talk about. Yeah. I mean, she could literally show him this entire email <laughs> yeah. and, and, she's, and she's worried because she's like, well, what if, you know, he doesn't like what I'm saying? If he is, if he's a good therapist, he will be okay with all of this. In fact, he'll, he'll be very thankful that you can trust him with all this stuff. You know, you as a client out there could say to your therapist, look, sometimes it seems like you're interested in my sexual life mm -hmm. in a way that's self-gratifying to yourself. Mm. I don't want to accuse you of anything, but it seems like that's the case. Now, if the therapist is worthy, the therapist will reflect or ha has already reflected and will have a thoughtful response to that. He might say something like, oh, I'm sorry. No, that that's not what was going on for me. I was purely interested in, in it because of blah, blah, blah. See, that seems a little accusatory to me. Like, I would... To the, I would, to the therapist? Yeah, like, you're getting off on me talking about this. I would be like, it's making me a little uncomfortable the level to which we're going into detail about my sex life. But this is the difference, and I'm so glad you're saying that. The di this is the difference between regular life and therapy. Mm. The therapist is a paid professional listener mm. and gets consultation and supervision to not take things personally. Mm. If, if it was your friend at work you might take it personally. But as a therapist myself, if a client said something like that to me, a central tenet of being a good therapist is to listen well to that and to contemplate it well and to respond well. Mm -hmm. That you're being paid to do that. <laughs> and so you're at your best self. And so when the client says something like that and accuses you, and clients do this all the time, clients have accused me of all sorts of terrible things. Oh my God. 
And of course, I have a, a, at least a, a little tiny bit, if not a lot, of urge to defend myself. Yeah. I have the knowledge and the experience to know that that's not going to help. And so I'll explore it. And I'll, I, so if she said that to me, I would say, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. That must have made you feel really uncomfortable. And I guess I'll have to think about that. And I, you know, I'm really sorry about that, but I, I never want you to feel uncomfortable. H- how would you like to do this from now on? Uh, and, or tell me more about your experience in those moments. That must, have, that must have felt invasive to some extent. I'm really sorry. Even though in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, you're crazy. You were the one talking about sex all the time. I never asked you a single You know, like, either you don't, as a therapist, react like you would with a friend or with mm-hmm. a coworker. You react like a therapist reacts. Mm. So, so that's important to point out. Um, so it's, it's completely fine to accuse your therapist, especially if you're involved in a psychodynamic therapy, which it sounds like this is. It's extremely important that the, that the that the client be honest with the therapist and provide the therapist opportunities to deepen the relationship and provide corrective experiences. Because maybe, you know, God, God knows there's really no way of knowing, but maybe this is exactly the issue that this client is having with inserting sexuality into her relationships, not being honest with people, setting up relationships to blow up with sexual tension. I mean, maybe that's her issue. And if she provided that material, Maybe that would be therapeutic for her. Mm -hmm. She goes on to say, on the other hand, I feel like he likes me, not sure in a sexual way. He finds me interesting and he may be interested to find if I, if that look in my eyes he was talking about has anything to do with my love or my deep feelings for him. He told me this sort of thing is natural and can be managed through therapy and there are techniques to help the client to cope with deep feelings for his or her therapist. So this is more evidence that they've already talked about her feelings towards him and he's just like it's it's okay you can have these feelings and there are ways to manage that and it's all part of therapy so i I, i'm guessing that he's probably on the ball hard to know she goes on i need help in how to tell my therapist that i like him that i'm addicted to therapy at this stage oh god is that a thing oh I am kind of attracted to him, but not necessarily in a sexual way, but because of how he is and treats me. So just to pause on that, you know, we have to define what addicted to therapy is. And to some extent, I'm the sort of therapist that says that if you are highly dependent on therapy and it's helping temporarily, then by all means, move into that dependence. There's nothing wrong with desperately wanting a secure relationship with someone that's helpful to you. Having said that, there's a flip side to that in in that if you make someone too dependent on therapy, they can't function without it. Mm. Or it might be very self-serving to the therapist because it makes them money. Yeah. And and all good therapists are good at being able to evaluate that. Is there a time that your therapist should like kick you out of the nest and be like, you win therapy? Absolutely. Goodbye. Absolutely. There are times when there are some clients that... Because out of habit, they just keep coming to therapy or they're afraid of what it's like to not be in therapy. That, for instance, what I do in situations like that is I will say, you know, would it make sense to cut back on on the amount of sessions per month or something? Mm -hmm. And then sort of, you know, trickle off into into less and less often. I've been wondering that about about that for myself because it it is so expensive. And, you know, as I try to be like more and more of like live an artist's life, I'm only working like 20 hours a week now so I can focus on grad school and actually like writing a ton. And I'm like, oh, like I look at that expense, you know, that huge expense in my budget. And I'm like, okay, should I be like backing away from this now? And then I go and I'm like, oh, it just feels good to like come in here and like unload all my feelings, you know? Yeah. So, you know, you have to make that choice. And, In general, I never terminate people because I've found that clients know where that line is. Mm -hmm. They know when it's worth the time and effort and when it's not. And I just basically leave it up to them. So it's pretty rare that I'll think, I think this it's a good time to kind of let go of the situation. It's pretty rare that that comes up. So she goes on to say, I love the way he hugs me. Oh, God. (laughs) He gives the best (laughs) blowjobs. Um, I mean, you know, we're, we're laughing, uh, but 
it's it's fine to hug. There's nothing wrong with that. It just there 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 just seem to be a lot of red flags. Yeah, there do. But they're due. Yeah. They're due. There does. You're, there we go. You're oh, a writer. I'm a writer. <laughs> it, but it's impossible to know because there's really nothing overt here that's saying something's wrong. In fact, given the way I like to interpret things, that innocent until proven guilty, it sounds like this is a wonderful relationship that you're that you're having. There seems to be some discussion or some sexual material in the room. There's nothing wrong with that. It it, it all just matters on where it's headed. If in a year from now, this patron writes to me and says, we had sex and it blew up in our face and now I hate him and I'm suing him, <laughs> then we know that, well, this what these were red flags. Yeah. If a couple of years from now, she says, you know, the therapy relationship is even deeper now and I feel even better about things and he's always been very professional and da 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 da, da then we can say this, whatever was happening right now, was just therapy pushing the envelope a little bit into areas that are that are a little interesting, you know? Like you say, you don't like rules. There's nothing wrong with talking about sex in therapy, right? Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with some kind of sexual attraction happening, right? You know what else, though? It's like I'm beyond a person who doesn't like rules. If something is a rule, it makes me want to not do it all the more. Really? So maybe this guy is really fighting his feelings and letting, allowing himself the, these little like... Jollies. These little jollies, these tiny jollies. Yeah. Um, and that happens. I hate for sure. that word, by the oh, way. Oh, really? That reference. I had forgotten how much I hate that word. Why do you hate that word? It's just jollies. It's so weird. It, it sounds like Christmas, Santa, but it has Claus? to do with like getting turned on and sex stuff and weirdness. <laughs> um, like get your jollies. Oh, that is the worst. Um, so I think that there's a lot of different, there's various pink flags I'll call them <laughs> pink flags yeah well yeah and the way that i it, i'm on the end of the spectrum that when when most therapists when they would read something like this in my experience there would be a lot of gasps mm. there'd be a lot of, oh my god this is so terrible i'm the sort of therapist of like innocent innocent until proven guilty we have no idea what this therapist would have to say yeah there's nothing that's happened so far they hug no big deal um is something happening maybe um, but we won't know until the future happens. Yeah, she needs there's to update no, us. There's nothing happening right now. Nothing's happened thus far. And there's nothing inherent in what's been done already that is bad therapy. And there's a lot of puritanical bullshit in our society that when the, the idea of sex comes up about anything, yeah, there's a lot of gasps. And there was like, I mean, I often at the end of fer- therapy feel like, hugging my therapist who is like an older woman, but it's like after a good talk, you hug it out. So there is this like urge to hug. Yeah. And then I don't because I'm like, she's my therapist, not my grandmother. Oh, really? Have you ever asked to hug your therapist? I have not. That sounds creepy. No, that's what you do. You May I hug you? Well, you don't want to just hug her. You want to, you, uh, I mean, it's up to you, of course, but if you had that, if I was your therapist and you had that urge or you had that desire, just like, oh, but but I don't want to hug because I feel ashamed or I feel da 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 da. I, I would want you to talk about it with me. What I do like is that she has recliner chairs and I've started just reclining in the chair with like my feet up. And last time she reclined in her chair. So we just both had our feet up facing each other. So there's that level of comfort going on, which I appreciated. So what's the final word with this patron's email? Do it. Do it. <laughs> just kidding. No. Um, Destroy I, his career. Destroy I think his career. It's possi- if it's possible that this is going to go somewhere and you are married and don't want anything to happen... Do you think it's a good idea for her to not to cut off this relationship with this therapist? It seems I, I will I will say it seems as if trouble is brewing. I could see how you would say that trouble could absolutely be brewing, or maybe there's nothing on the fire and there's nothing brewing at all. There, there it's it's really impossible to know given what she's saying. Yeah, it's I could see it's very easy to believe that, and it, and I could see a lot of inexperienced therapist saying you know, that this client should run for the hills or this therapist should refer. But take it from me, t- if you talk to more experienced therapists, they will have run into situations like this enough to, to not be afraid of it, essentially. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not that big of a deal. This is far afield from having sex with your client. Do they need to have like a come to Jesus session where it's like, right. listen, I need to talk to you. 
you know, I need to tell when you, you all hug me, I have feelings. When this, I have feelings. Right. I need to make sure that nothing is happening here and how, and how we're going to go forward in these circumstances where I'm having feelings for you. Well, what's and, the deal? And I, there's a part of me that kind of wants things to move forward with you. And I, I just wanted to know what that's all about. I'd like to talk about that. I'd like to take my clothes off and see what happens. And it seems like sometimes you're interested in that. It seems like you might be fighting your feelings. You know, I want to talk about that. And the therapy, for, for some modes of therapy, that is completely right down the middle therapy to talk about what's happening in the room, to yeah. be real, to be honest. And again, as, if the therapist is good in getting proper consultation, then that can be a very enriching conversation. And you'd be surprised how many conversations are like that in therapy. It's not very frequent, but there are a lot of intense conversations. It's real. Um, imagine she goes to her therapist and she tells all that to him. And he says, you know what? I'm so glad you talked about that. I can tell you that I will never be in a relationship outside of the therapeutic relationship with you. I will never entertain any kind of sexual urge uh, along those lines. I will never, that, that will never ever happen, I guarantee you. And I will also say that I'm a human being and sure, sometimes things come up for me, but, but I don't entertain them and mm -hmm. I, you're a client and I care about you in the way that I care about a client or the way I care about my younger sister or something. You know, I, and he says, we can't. And then they look into each other's eyes and they get closer and closer. <laughs> <laughs> that's the way I see it going down <laughs> that forbidden fruit thing for me oh. kills me but then also it's interesting as a client to know that like your you boyfriend's would be... butt like you that's forbidden fruit <laughs> to like poke his butt you're just like it's forbidden fruit I have a compulsion to poke it I should explain that on a previous episode we talked about how when my boyfriend is walking up the stairs in front of me, I just want to poke him in the butt, and it really annoys the crap out of him, and I have to not do that, but I don't for him. But and you, also, but, not, but it makes the urge even stronger. It makes now. the urge even stronger. Um, as the client in this situation, knowing that you would ruin your therapist's career if you did anything about it, is an interesting wrinkle in the problem. Yeah, they could run off to Thailand together. No. I would just <laughs> is get Thailand away. like where anything goes sexually yeah. in well, your mind? Uh, yes. And also it's like where people kind of like, if you have, it's like your second chance. If you're like, oh, I'm wanted for fraud in America, but now I live in Thailand because of that. And yeah. it's, everything's fine. Mm -hmm. um, if this were me, yeah. lay person, yeah. Paulette, American lay person, Paulette yeah. Perhatch. Um, and I was like, I really don't want anything to happen. I might just remove myself from the situation because then... He becomes more and more of the forbidden fruit. It could be like an it become it could become for her like an emotional affair where it's well. So I don't but, know. I, I think which, that if you're which, feeling feelings like that, you have to like remove yourself from it. Which which would be a potentially very healthy move. Another healthy move could be to talk about that in therapy and wonder about why you Paulette have such a hard time with forbidden fruit. You know, yeah. what is it about the forbidden fruit that attracts you? It, let's talk about that, you know, and what sort of issue are you avoiding by going toward the forbidden fruit instead of the fruit that's in front of your face? So there's, there's a lot of questions that can come up. Yeah. You as a client have total control over what you do, but if, I, if, a, if a client said that to me, I would throw that out there and say, you, you can terminate with me, that's fine, but... How about this? Blah, blah, blah. I acknowledge that there's the investment in the relationship with a therapist where like, well, I, do I want to go to a new therapist and tell them about my sister and my mom and da, 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 like they got to get the whole background. So there is an investment there that I'm not, I'm not saying it's a light thing to terminate with your therapist. The final word that I'll say about patron Mahela's email is that she's very brave to write in and to let us use her name. <laughs> and because there's nothing to be ashamed of here. There's absolutely nothing to be worried about, really. If in the future something bad happens, then we can look back and say there was something to worry about. <laughs> but there's nothing here that is abnormal, and there's nothing here that, to be ashamed of and nothing to be guilty of. It's normal, like we were talking about, when you develop a deep relationship with a, with a therapist and client, that you're going to have some of those feelings, and that's okay. And in our puritanical sensibilities, we have to fight against our urge to judge and to shame and to run away. 
and instead just accept and say that feelings are feelings and actions are actions. Just keep your privates private. We can keep our privates private and our feelings as feelings and our actions we don't have to go toward. And she is very aware of herself. She is not blaming anybody. She's just saying, these are my feelings. I'm wondering what's going on with my therapist. I'm getting a vibe. I have questions. I don't know. She seems very healthy in this way. And I think that she's, she's doing real great. And it sounds like it's, it's a very wonderful therapeutic relationship. Again, if in a year you're having sex, then we can say this was a terrible relationship in which he was grooming you. <laughs> but if things continue to going as they are, which we don't have any reason to believe that they won't, this is a deep relationship that's providing her an opportunity to learn from this experience, to learn experientially from this deep relationship with him and hopefully it'll bear fruit. And it sounds like it already is. She's saying that the therapy is really helping. What about telling her husband? That is a very good question. We'll do that on another episode <laughs> of Psychology in Seattle. Thanks for joining us out there. Please take care of yourself because... You're worth it. And you deserve it. And you deserve it. And you deserve it.